30 seconds. That's how long it'll take you to watch this announcement. What if I told you that in just 30 seconds, you can help someone, just like yourself, to live again, to love, to play, to laugh. By joining the Armenian Bone Marrow Donor Registry, you're taking a huge step towards saving an Armenian life. Once you're registered, you'll be part of a vast network of donors who have already saved lives all over the world. But we still need your help. Only an Armenian donor can save a fellow Armenian. And it only takes 30 seconds. My name is Sreli Hainakisner, yes, Dr. Frida Jordan, and Boska Tsuti Donor Neri Himnadrami Nahagan. Yes, I am a heart surgeon, shot your heart to cure them. Vorofete, Hospelue, watch me in Kaskeg or Kapumni Ayan Kaskeri Masin. Այլ այլ քաղցկեղների մասին ենք այսօր զրուս տալու եւ դա ընդհանուր աղիքների կանսերի մասին է խոսում որ շատ տարածված է եւ կարեւոր է որ մեր հայնակիցները լսեն մեկած շատ շատ կարեւոր մասնագետից մեր մասագետը տարիներ եղել է USC-ի համասարանի բժշկական հաստատության ղեկավարը եւ ներկայում Huntington Hospital-ի Cancer Center Center-ի դայրեկտորն է։ Ինքը տարիների մեծ փորձառություն ունի նաեւ research-ի մեջ եւ հետազոտություն է կատարել այս բնագավառում։ Ես կուզեմ որ նաեւ մեր շնորհակալական խոսքը ասեմ Glendale Outpatient Surgery Center in Hatkapes Tikin Silva Moradin for Mezit Aunt Hasrets Ice Bijishki Head, Irang Irans Clinicum Katarum and Tarber Tarber Surgery Nert, Yev Vira Hatuchuner, Yev Amena Karevor, Der Vor Irang Unen, Ice Bonagabarum, Yev Irang Shestum, Vor Polo Hivanerin Vopes. And Taniki Antamner and Nayum, ye Professor Hivan the Eden Shat Lavazga. Mera Sorba Hura Ashatume Shat Motkis Ice Kent on the head, ye Vori Massim Meng Maramasa Kelesing. Yes, Petkem Im Harsazus Sharnakem Anglerino, ye Pusover to Karanak, Motikis Hetevek. Uh, after a long introduction, <laughs> uh, Dr. Kaufman, welcome, welcome, and thank you very much for um, giving us your time and expertise, and that uh, we all need to hear from you about the beautiful work that you have been doing, all the research in the area of uh, colorectal uh, uh, surgery. Please uh, introduce yourself, and uh, let's see uh, what um, uh, new research and funding you have got in this field. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Jordan, for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with you. Uh, I've had the great opportunity over a number of years to lead both clinical and research programs, and that dates all the way back to my time at Johns Hopkins and then the University of Southern California, and now at, at the Huntington Hospital, where I direct a research program and lead the Cancer Center at the mm -hmm. Huntington Hospital. Our main research objectives are really to improve clinical care for patients. So colorectal cancer is such a common condition, and in the United States, there's about 400,000 colorectal resections done every year. About almost 150,000 cases of colorectal cancer, but if you take all of the other types of colorectal disorders, we do about 400,000 cases per year, so we have a great opportunity mm -hmm. to improve clinical care, to reduce complications, to reduce the length of stay for patients. So most of my clinical research now is on improving outcomes, improving patient safety, improving patient quality. I also run research programs related to the changes around genes that occur in patients who are at risk for colorectal cancer. And mm -hmm. that also includes patients with increased body weight, which has been an area of my interest, the relationship between increased weight and colorectal cancer risk. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, 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 the first thing that comes across mind is that uh, why people get col uh, colon cancer. 
Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, great question. Uh, colorectal cancer is actually the third most common cancer in the United States among both men and women. And about 140, 150,000 cases per year with everyone wanting to be able to prevent development of cancer. And there are some risk factors that we can talk about that allow for modification of lifestyle and prevention of disease. But most people who develop colorectal cancer don't have any associated family risk or any associated genetic risk. In fact, 75% of people who get colorectal cancer have no risk at all. Oh, I thought that there is a genetic link. There is a genetic uh -huh. risk. And in fact, there 1%, only 1% 1 1 of people mm -hmm. who develop colorectal cancer have a specific gene mutation okay. where they form thousands and thousands of polyps starting at a very young age. Okay. Another 3% uh -huh. of individuals with colorectal cancer have another syndrome where they don't make polyps in the true sense of a little lesion that can be removed. These tend to be more flat polyps or polyps that occur quickly. Yes. But again, that's only 3%. Yes. And then you have a little bit more than 20% that have a family history with some genetic predisposition, but not one of these well-defined syndromes. So mm -hmm. in the United States, the risk for the average at-risk population for developing colorectal cancer is 6%. Mm -hmm. If you have one first-degree relative with colorectal cancer, that doubles. If you have two first-degree relatives that have had colorectal cancer, advanced polyps, that risk goes up three to four times. So you're almost talking of one in four risk of developing colorectal That's cancer in those individuals. Risk. Very, very high risk. Very high risk. So uh, what would you advise uh, our uh, audience to do the, in terms of preventive, in terms of uh, you know, um, having screening done, special screenings? Sure. Well, let, let's talk about prevention mm -hmm. first. Uh, th there have been some um, uh, studies done, and there have been recommendations on an international basis that actually red meat uh, in reasonable amounts is not harmful. Mm -hmm. And those amounts that are suggested... What is reasonable amount? Well, uh, great question. So it's thought Because Armenians are meat eaters. I know, I know. I, I'm just the messenger. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. the, the thresholds for uh, red meat uh, are thought to be about three quarters of a pound per week, with anything more than that being additive to the risk mm -hmm. for developing colorectal cancer. Smoking has been recently added to the list of, of risk factors for colorectal cancer. And probably the most uh, modifiable risk factor is, is physical activity. Mm -hmm. So whether it's occupational physical activity or walking around the block or doing uh, pretty aggressive exercise, any physical activity actually decreases the risk for developing colorectal cancer. So a risk factor is a sedentary lifestyle, not doing much physical activity. Yes. And that's probably the most uh, easy risk factor to modify is to get up, get active, and, and working towards living a more healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And also obesity? Obesity. Yeah. In, in fact, body mass index, which is the way that we standardize obesity because people may weigh 300 pounds and be 6'5", or they may weigh 300 pounds mm -hmm. and, and be 5'5", five five, and that's a much different risk profile. Mm -hmm. So obesity is a risk factor, not only for development of colorectal cancer, but for death from colorectal cancer. In terms of screening that you, mm -hmm. that you asked about, um, the most important thing that, that anyone who is 50 or older or has a family history and is younger than 50 and has no symptoms, it, the most important thing one can do to prevent colorectal cancer is get screened for colorectal cancer. There are a lot of screening tests that can be done. There are a lot of screening tests that we offer at the Glendale Outpatient Surgery Center. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of screening tests that patients can be offered through their primary care physicians or through uh, gastroenterologists. But the, the gold standard for screening is a colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. Colonoscopy is an option set forth by the American Cancer Society and other societies. And in fact, patients get a list of options. They can choose to have a colonoscopy. They can choose to have a flexible sigmoidoscopy. They can choose to have their stool tested for blood. They can choose to have their stool tested for DNA fragments. 
that can all be All those there. are uh, they're predictive? All, they're, of... they're all predictive uh -huh. for colorectal cancer. Uh, some are predictive for polyps. Mm -hmm. The advantage to colonoscopy is that if any of the other tests are positive, one still has to undergo a colonoscopy anyway yes, yes. to then be able to find out why that test was positive and to be able to remove a polyp. Mm -hmm. So most of us advocate for colonoscopy as the initial yes. screening test because mm -hmm. we can identify polyps, we can remove them if they're there, if we can't remove them, we can biopsy, biopsy them yes. and then uh -huh. refer the patient to someone like me or another surgeon who's able to remove that segment of the colon, put the ends back together and either treat a cancer when it's very curable or prevent a cancer from ever developing. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with colonoscopy is if the insurance company will pay. Yes. Uh, but um, is there a guideline saying that because it's a screening at a certain age, the insurance company has to put it in the mandate of uh, allowing the patient to go through this yeah, procedure? Yeah, so you, you obviously hit on a very um, uh, timely subject with healthcare reform, yes. with insurance companies trying to offload risk. Um, Colorectal cancer being preventable is one of those screening tests where there is coverage for it. Okay. In fact, there will be coverage under the new health care reform. Now, screening is often considered differently than a diagnostic colonoscopy. So if we take all colonoscopies, there are people who need a colonoscopy because they have symptoms. They might have bleeding. They might have a change in bowel habits. They might have abdominal pain. That's known as a diagnostic colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. Symptoms create the need for looking into those symptoms. On the other hand, we have the whole host of asymptomatic individuals that hit that age of 50, and those are the individuals considered in need of screening. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, those tests are covered. Mm -hmm. that, that's very good. Uh, what is the survival rate of uh, colon cancer? The survival rate for colon cancer really depends on the age at which, uh, not the age, I'm sorry, the stage, stage. the stage at which diagnosed. someone is diagnosed. Yes. So uh, for all cancers, we have, um, on a broadest sense, what's known as local disease, meaning that it hasn't gotten outside of the colon yet, even to the lymph nodes. We have regional disease, which means that it's gone to the lymph nodes, but stopped there. And then we have distant disease. So spread. that has spread. That mm -hmm. has spread outside of the area of the colon, outside of the area of the attached lymph nodes mm -hmm. or surrounding lymph nodes. And survival depends on stage. We stage these Roman numerals one through four, one being the earliest, four being mm -hmm. distant disease. Mm -hmm. But for local disease, which is stage one or stage two, survival is in the 80 to 90 plus percent range. Very, very curable condition yes. if caught early. Yes. For regional disease, that means the lymph nodes are involved and that's also considered stage three disease. We're talking 60 to 70 percent survival. So still, compared to so many other cancers it's that we treat, high. incredibly curable yes. with, yes. with a great opportunity for survival. And then lastly, for distant disease, patients with stage four disease, there's still the opportunity in the five to 10 percent range, which is unheard of for many other cancers. We're getting better chemotherapy all the time. If the metastasis is in the liver or the lung and just a single or a couple lesions, they can yes. often be removed yes. for cure, for long-term cure. And I have many, many patients that presented with advanced disease, with metastatic disease, who are still alive five, 10 years later. That's fantastic. Now, the course of treatment is you start with uh, chemo or you start with chemo and radiation? Yeah. The course of treatment uh -huh. is very different depending on whether the primary cancer is yeah. in the colon or in the rectum. Yes. So for colon cancer, the primary treatment is surgery. Mm -hmm. The colon is a long tube that starts in the right lower abdomen and goes across and then comes down yes. the left side and then exit out the body. The if the cancer is in the colon and it hasn't spread elsewhere, then the primary treatment is to remove that section of colon and put the ends back together. Mm -hmm. And we typically do that now more and more 
with minimally invasive techniques. Uh, how how so would you do that? I, I use robotic surgery, mm -hmm. I use laparoscopic surgery, I make single incision surgery so that I can do a whole colon operation through about an inch and a half operation. That's fantastic. Or multiple small and pores. And the patient can be recovered in two or three days? Half of our patients go home in two or three days. Wow. It's so different than the old days where yes. patients woke up, they had a tube in their nose, yes. they had a big incision on yeah. their abdomen, uh -huh. they were, uh, food was withheld for several days and the lengths of stay were uh -huh. seven, ten days. Half of our patients now go home on days two or That's three. That's fantastic. For rectal cancer, it's a whole different set of treatments. Mm -hmm. So rectal, the, the rectum is the last six inches of the large intestine. The colon connects to the rectum and then that's, that's where waste material exits. Rectal cancer, if it's caught early, just stage one, then the surgery can be the first line of treatment. And that can either be through a laparoscopic or robotic approach, an open mm -hmm. approach, or a simple excision through someone's bottom without any incisions on their abdomen. If it's stage two or stage three, then we get the medical and radiation oncologists involved first, and we do chemo, we do radiation, we wait for a cooling off period for yes. the cancer to shrink down more, then we do surgery, then there's more chemo, and then the, the whole process for rectal cancer takes almost a year. A year. Yeah. And that's Different than also colon. good recovery in that area? Also, two, same two, three, maybe four days recovery. A, a little yes. bit uh, longer because of mm -hmm. the, the technical differences in the operation, uh, but often two to four days. After and with surgery. a good survival rate? With same survival. That's yes. fantastic. Yes. That's very good. Um, for the stage three and four, you need to go into radiation and chemo? For stage three and four for colon, mm -hmm. chemo, certainly. For stage three, for rectal, usually radiation first, although the radiation can be done after surgery. Uh, stage four cancer, sometimes radiation is used depending on the size of the tumor and if surgery is indicated, but it's mostly chemo and often surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Kaufman, I'm so amazed of the kind of research that you are involved, uh, especially about this uh, genetic mutation. Um, are you um, using stem cell therapy or are you in that uh, uh, area of research? It, it, that is not uh, one of my areas of research. Clearly there are some great strides being made and some some very exciting preliminary data looking at stem cell therapy for other intestinal conditions, uh, for conditions that affect newborns, uh, mm -hmm. for inflammatory conditions. Uh, but, but that has not become an active area of research for cancer yet. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think the future is very exciting for the inflammatory conditions. Um, for cancer, we, we are making great strides in understanding more and more about the genetic profiles of uh, individual cancers. So uh, in the past, it was one size fits all for the type of chemotherapy. And now yes. in the United States, and especially in many countries mm -hmm. in Europe, a lot of the information is being obtained before chemo is started so yes. that we don't expose patients to toxicities of yes. chemo that's not going to help them and give yes. them the better chemo that meets the profile yes. of their tumor. So, analysis. Yes, yes, yes. So yes. I think, you know, we're yeah. in that exciting time yeah. of personalized medicine yes. so that yes. it doesn't become yes. a, a one-size-fits-all. Interestingly all. enough, uh, we, uh, in our lab in Armenia, we were doing this uh, mutation analysis for the, uh, administrating dif different chemos and we work with the uh, uh, Seattle uh, yes. University. Yes. Yeah, Washington, Seattle. And it's fantastic. It's fantastic because, uh, as you say, people die of chemo, <laughs> the, the toxicity yes. of chemo rather than, you know, get cured. Yes. If, if they are not taking it in. And yes. And, and, you know, what's, what's um, fortunate for colorectal cancer patients, they, the chemo does not tend to be as... Uh, aggressive in terms of its side effects as with other malignancies. So mm -hmm. patients tend not to lose their hair. They have some of the, the common side effects of nausea, of um, 
uh, neuropathies, you know, altered feeling in their hands and feet and different taste. Uh, but, but the chemo that makes people really, really sick is not typically part of the regimen for colorectal cancer. Mm -hmm. But the key, obviously, is for all of your viewers and their loved ones is to get screened so we never get to that point where someone's going to need chemo. If, if we can remove those polyps Absolutely. early, or we can treat colorectal yes. cancer at stage one and mostly stage two, then their need for chemo is gonna be less and less. Uh, I have a question because there's a lot of it on the internet, uh, colon cleansing. Yes. No, <laughs> this is, is it beneficial or it can be damaging? Well, <laughs> To my knowledge, there mm -hmm. haven't been any scientific studies uh -huh. that promote the concept of colon cleansing, except when you're trying to do a, a colonoscopy. Absolutely. That is a must. Right. But that's that, a must. That's, that's a nightmare to go through. <laughs> that's the, clearly the worst yes, part of, I know. of yes. colonoscopy. Yeah. Um, but doing on a regular basis, that can be damaging I, too. I am not a big fan yeah. of the concept. And, uh, you know, what we're finding out more and more recently and a lot of investigation on this is the importance of the bacteria in our yes. colon. So we have tenfold more bacteria in our colon, 10 times more bacteria than the total number of cells in our body. Mm -hmm. And we have to coexist with those bacteria. And when those bacteria are healthy, that provides benefit to us as individuals. When those bacteria get wiped out, when those bacteria allow the unhealthy kind of bacteria to overgrow, we get much more ill. There's been some fascinating work um, repopulating the colon of individuals with chronic illnesses mm -hmm. to be able to cure them of infectious diarrhea. There's some interesting, fascinating ongoing trials now uh, to look at repopulating uh, an individual's colon that has a chronic inflammatory condition and being able to improve that. Now that's not proven yet, but there are some very exciting preliminary data mm -hmm. looking at um, being able to repopulate the colon. In fact, there have been studies in mice where you can take the, the you can replace the bacteria in a mouse that is obese with uh, the bacteria from a mouse that's not obese and that m mouse will lose weight that oh. is obese. So a lot of the bacteria in our colon helps us metabolize Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. sugars and other nutrients Breakdowns. break down. Yes, and yes, when well. those get altered, mm -hmm. uh, one can get a chronic disease. So mm -hmm. the fact that we're trying to wipe out those bacteria and rid the body of all of those bacteria, uh, I'm, that, I'm not a big fan of yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, how about this probiotic? Uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of probiotics. You, you are a big I, fan. I am. Okay. I think there are certain okay. bacteria that, yeah. that help us that when we repopulate the colon with them, it can lead to health yeah, benefits. Yeah, and Armenians are big time yogurt uh, yes, eaters. Yes, so <laughs> yes. am I. Yes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, that, that's fantastic. Um, so um, apart from uh, colon cancer, what other cancers under it's, uh, you are overseeing in, at your department? Yes, so, so I'm the medical director of the cancer center at the Huntington Hospital. We actually serve about 2,000 patients per year with new diagnoses of cancers. Mm. So that's not including patients that are undergoing continuous therapy or being followed up three, five, seven years later. These are new, new diagnoses patients. of cancer. So we, uh, the most common cancer that we treat at Huntington is breast cancer, mm -hmm. followed by prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, lung cancer, and then gynecologic malignancies. Oh my God. Okay, yeah. Um, you see the rate of increase in colon cancer? Uh, it, it's a great question. Actually, that rate has been reducing over time for the general population, probably because we're having more people screened for colorectal mm -hmm. cancer. So if you remove that polyp, lip, yes. then the cancer uh, doesn't have a chance to develop and grow. Mm -hmm. The group that is increasing in an alarming fashion is actually young people with rectal cancer. So, you know, mm -hmm. in, people in their 40s and younger than 40, that, that rate of cancer development is actually higher 
than anywhere else in the colon. And those groups are not usually screened. Those groups are not usually screened. And yes. probably the only uh, chance of them being detected early or, or saving them from having to undergo major therapy is if they develop bleeding. Mm -hmm. But the challenge is they might develop bleeding and they go to see their doctor and since it's uncommon mm -hmm. traditionally, they say, oh, it's probably hemorrhoids. hemorrhoids. Don't worry about it. Yes. So I would, I would put the message out to, to your viewers that uh, it's really important that mm -hmm. if there is bleeding, that needs to be investigated. It's not just hemorrhoids. It's not just a fissure. It's not just a benign condition. Hopefully it will be, but it's easy enough to go through the evaluation to make sure that there isn't something else brewing there. Absolutely. And I've, I've seen cancers in individuals in their 20s. Not common, but it happens. That's yeah, that's very sad, but that happens. It does yes, happen. That happens. So the uh, main indicator is that if you have uh, blood, yes, uh, just investigate. Investigate. And don't ignore it. Right. Yeah, right. that's that's the right. major. So event. so um, you know, colorectal cancer is known as the silent killer, yes. because most patients who develop colorectal cancer have no symptoms. Mm. Individuals that have symptoms often present later. You know, if a tumor grows bigger, it might bleed or it might obstruct mm -hmm. or it might cause change in bowel habits. But um, for the most part, there are few symptoms that develop. Mm -hmm. which, is, which is why people have to be very vigilant. They have to go for their screening and vigilant. not avoid this. Yes. Uh, colonoscopy, which is not very fun to do, but it's a must to do. You know, the, the, the part that's not fun is the bowel prep. Yes. Once you do the bowel prep oh, and yes, you're yes. in the endoscopy yeah, suite yeah. or the Glendale Outpatient yes, Surgery Center or the hospital, hospital or Huntington wherever. Hospital, yeah. uh, it's, uh, the drugs are great. You don't yes. remember anything. You're under anesthesia and you just wake up after 10 you, you minutes. You wake up, you've done. had a nice sleep. <laughs> yes. and, and then you can go out with confidence yeah. saying yes, that absolutely. either I know I have a condition that needs to be watched with yes. polyps or yeah. if I've had a yes. tumor, it's caught early or I'm clean. Yes. Now, I say that with, with the warning that colonoscopy as well as all of the tests that we do for screening are not perfect. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine this long tube that's five feet long that has folds in it where a polyp can be on the other side of a fold, we know that there are certain guidelines yes. that, uh, that make for a more complete colonoscopy. But even if they're followed, it's not a perfect test. There is nothing perfect, 100%. There's nothing, there's nothing perfect. Even but mammogram if, is no. not. I mean, this is it. None perfect. of these are perfect. So you can rest assured when you yeah, get exactly. that result that, that you're as clean as you can as be. As you can. Yeah. But if someone has a colonoscopy and let's say three months later they start bleeding, mm -hmm. they need to go back to their doctor and they need to get more investigations yes. because it's not a perfect test. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. <laughs> we, we, we can talk we about can talk this for, for a long, long, time. For a long yes. time. And I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, uh, in future, we'll ask you to come back and uh, uh, yeah, uh, share your great knowledge with our audience. Thank you very much. Again, thank you to the uh, Glendale Outpatient uh, uh, Surgery that uh, provided us with the opportunity of meeting you and uh, sharing your uh, uh, vast knowledge in this uh, field. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaufman, for coming. Thank you, Dr. I, Jordan. I wish you all the best, especially in the research area, because we need your uh, research and to deal with all these mutations that uh, is yes. happening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sirili Harina Gisner, Husto Vor Menk Aragatsang Tezi Hagort Paheng Ais Hivanduchan Masin Yev Micho Miusan Kam Seshunzez. Shatshunar Galen. It only takes a few painless steps to become a bone marrow donor. Mouth swab. Three seconds, no pain. Five out of 5,000. Blood work. Five minutes, a little pinprick. Two out of five. Physical. Four hours, no sweat. One out of two. Harvesting stem cells. Three hours, no pain. A little pinprick, but no sweat, no anesthesia, and no surgery. Stem cells replenished in a few days. 
one out of 5,000. It took seven hours, five minutes, and three seconds of my life to help save the rest of mine. Leukemia doesn't think twice, neither should you. Be a donor, save a life.